Welcome to the Molecular Moments Podcast. In today's episode, we sit down with our guest, Dr. Rick Briscoe, Senior VP of Safety Assessment and Research Operations at Cerevel Therapeutics. Rick is a 25-year veteran of the pharmaceutical industry with stints in academia, CRO, big pharma, and biotech. In his academic research and throughout his pharma career, he has focused on developing a further understanding for how neurodegenerative diseases work and how to develop drugs to target the very challenging field of neuroscience. Rick has a true passion for this field that I think you'll feel throughout our conversation. So as always, we're talking science as scientists do. And without further ado, here's another episode of Molecular Moments. Welcome to the podcast, Rick. I'm delighted to have you join me today. Can you just start with giving us some highlights from your career? Yeah, thanks, Chad. Uh, really appreciate the time today. So I've had a, a, an interesting career, as you mentioned, in a, in a variety of settings uh, on the uh, pharmaceutical, big pharmaceutical side, the CRO side, and uh, now the biotech side. And that's given me sort of a really broad perspective to understand the business in a way that a lot of people that are just in one segment probably don't. So I started out, uh, I was a postdoc at the University of Michigan. And um, after a few years there in the pharmacology department, I was recruited to a CRO. And uh, at that location, I spent uh, about three years building up a a lab lab team and um, after that stint, I got recruited to Merck. I was at Merck for about 17 years, did various jobs at Merck, um, headed the safety pharmacology group for a few years. I also worked on a rotational assignment for about two years in corporate strategy. And so I reported into the strategy office supporting the CEO. Uh, that was a pretty interesting uh, opportunity during the shearing plow Merck integration. And then uh, about three years ago, I got recruited to come to Cerevel in the biotech space, and uh, we're a uh, startup based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, that focuses on neuroscience, small molecule drug development. Wow, that's awesome and a great sort of intro to what uh, to what you've done. I want to even step it back a little bit, though, because... I'm interested in what got you into science. What was your motivation, right? And and, uh, for those of our audience who haven't figured it out, you're my brother, my big brother. So I was there watching uh, some of the action as you were uh, growing up. And I'd love to hear from you. What got you into science? What was your motivation from early on? We've heard some really interesting stories from some of our guests. And I'd like to hear you tell that side of it as well. Yeah, so, you know, it really goes back to, uh, I've always been very curious about how things work in the world. When I was young, you know, I I was always exploring biology in the environment, spent many summers at a nature center day camp at the local nature center, and um, did many things playing in the mud and ponds uh, with various creatures. But that really was one of the starting points for me to really get interested in biology, then I sort of transitioned into um, you know high school, and I discovered that I didn't really like school because it was boring. Um, <laughs> but yet, um, one thing that I did start doing in high school was scuba diving, and uh, scuba diving really ignited a, uh, a really different interest in biology for me in terms of marine biology and all of the diversity in the ocean, it was really intriguing to me. And so, you know, it was really those experiences early on that started me down the path of being interested in science. And then I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I went to college uh, for undergrad, and I discovered uh, a professor there, Gary Dunbar, who was starting up a neuroscience lab. And uh, I became uh, really interested in neuroscience uh, pretty much from uh, the early part of my freshman year of college. And uh, it was all uh, all downhill from there, so to speak. All, all downhill or all uphill. So that was at Central Michigan, <laughs> uh, Central Michigan <laughs> University, correct. right? In, in Mount correct. Pleasant. Yeah. Yeah. And that's uh, that's amazing. And, and just a little tidbit, since we are brothers, I, I would say I remember many nights at the uh, at the kitchen table uh, <laughs> studying, right? Where, <laughs> where yes, as you uh, as you moved along. So it's interesting that you bring that up because I think that experiential learning is so important. And it's so important to some people where where they get their motivation from 
from the experiential side, and it takes a while until that clicks with people and how do you apply that and have a career? Because no matter what that start was or what your grades were in, in high school, which clearly you know got you into a, into a good university and a good situation, you've been successful by any measure of a, of a career uh, for sure. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, w- you know, speaking on the experiential side, uh, one thing while I was in college, it was uh, probably the most pivotal experience for me to really decide to go into neuroscience drug development was uh, I spent a couple years working at a transitional living facility for chronic mentally ill adults. In, in that facility, these were people that were very men- mentally challenged, ill people, mm-hmm. uh, schizophrenia, very severe schizophrenia. And um, I I really learned a lot about these patients. Um, they're just people that are really struggling to uh, to live a normal life, struggling with schizophrenia and other chronic mental illnesses. And and I saw how the medications they were taking really made an impact, um, both positive and unfortunately negative, because there are a lot of um, side effects of those medications. And uh, one one patient in particular, she was a, a really nice person that was really struggling with schizophrenia. And uh, she went on a new medication called Clozaril at the time. And Clozaril, a, a, it was a newer antipsychotic that had a lot of promise for tremendous efficacy. And she went from a person that was pretty pretty much incapacitated, not able to live independently. And then she went on Clozaril and within a couple months was almost back to being able to live independently. It was a just a shocking transformation to see. And then... I discovered one of the big problems with a lot of psychiatric medicines are that there are potentially bad side effects. And she got a side effect from that medicine called agranulocytosis, which basically causes your white blood cells to to die off. And so that's potentially a fatal condition, and she had to go off that medication. And so Mm -hmm. that experience with that one patient was really the thing I tracked back to wanting to do better for patients. And it really changed my thinking of what I wanted to do long term. And I wanted to develop new antipsychotics. And I've been doing that ever since. Yeah. So I want, I want to hear more about that because the CNS space is so challenging, right? Anything in neuroscience, any, any of the drugs in that space are, are so challenging. So can you just talk in general about what the various challenges are, what the I don't know, state of the market is the right way to put it, but kind of the state of the market and, and uh, why, you know, and then maybe leverage that. I'm curious why, why Cerevel is going to win in that space to, to the extent you can talk about that as well. Yeah. So, you know, with a lot of uh, indications, uh, you know, like oncology, for example, there are a lot of really um, good opportunities for uh, accessible biomarkers. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's something, you know, in a a blood test that can be developed that can track a genotyping that can be, you know, identify the tumor type, that really gets to the root of the physiology and the pharmacology you need to treat those indications. One of the biggest challenges with neuroscience is uh, the brain, as we know, is extremely complex and doesn't offer a lot of opportunities for really robust biomarkers. Uh, Mm -hmm. A lot of neuropsychiatric conditions basically have expert evaluation using basically questionnaires that help characterize the symptoms, and then the clinician would put uh, a patient on a given medication. We've gotten uh, better over the years. Now we're using uh, PET tracers uh, to do PET Mm -hmm. imaging Mm -hmm. to look at receptor occupancy in the brain um, so we can really understand where our medicines are, are going. But still, that's at a receptor level, and it's not the integrated uh, physiology of the brain. It's really looking at very localized displacement from targets. And so it's really, I think, neuroscience is really lacking the ability to have really robust biomarkers. That's been the challenge, I think, overall. Yeah, and and the few that are out there are not very specific to a certain disease, right? I think they're more of sort of different brain activity in response to general modifications. I was just I was just reading an article about some different uh, biomarkers for CNS. And the point of the article without uh, getting into too many details was really focused on, hey, we found biomarkers that are specific to this particular disease, which was really unique. So yeah, um, so it continues to be sort of the holy grail. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, what we're trying to do at Cerevelo, we're really trying to characterize pathways in the brain and modulate receptor systems in a very specific way 
traditional um, antipsychotics, for example, often uh, modulate multiple transmitter systems. And, um, you know, what that causes is a lot of off-target effects or un uh, undesired effects, you know, metabolic syndrome and obesity, um, you know, a real common weight gain is a real common issue with a lot of psychiatric medications. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to modulate in a more specific way than traditional therapies. Yeah, that's uh, that's fantastic. I think the the story of Cerevel, uh, just from the standpoint of of how a company is sort of born, I think is somewhat interesting and unique. Is that something you can uh, you can tell us a little bit about how how Cerevel came about? Yeah, so Pfizer had been developing uh, a, a very broad neuroscience portfolio for uh, many, many years and um, uh, had made the business decision um, several years ago to um, divest that portfolio of assets. And, you know, they'd been working in that field for, you know, probably 20 years or more. And the assets in particular that we are um, formed from were, you know, a good 20 years of research. And so when they divested that portfolio, they... Um, they partnered with Bain Capital to form Cerevel. And so it was a partnership between Pfizer and, and Bain that initially formed the company. And the assets that we started out with were all uh, Pfizer uh, molecules. Okay. And so um, now we're a publicly traded company. Initially, we're mm -hmm. a private company. And uh, we also have, uh, in addition to the Pfizer assets, a, a robust early discovery pipeline of our own for uh, our, our own molecules now. Yeah, that's exciting. And, and so maybe we'll just have you step back a little bit to Merck again, uh, because I'm interested in your role at, at Cerevel, but, but I wanted to step back and hear more about what you did at Merck. And then maybe we can step into Cerevel and just kind of understand how uh, this space, the safety pharmacology space works and what, uh, what, what you did there to, to move it forward. Sure. Yeah. So at Merck, um, you know, my initial few years there were um, heading up the global safety pharmacology group. So mm -hmm. the basic idea of that team of uh, researchers was to do initial safety testing for uh, first in human dosing. So we wanted to make sure our, me our medications, our potential medications were safe for phase one uh, clinical trials volunteers. As you know, phase one studies uh, in the small molecule space tend to be very small uh, phase one studies, you know, maybe eight or mm -hmm. 10 subjects right. at a time, uh, very carefully controlled studies. But uh, so what we would do is characterize, you know, the basic profile to let the clinicians know what to monitor for or what to worry about and pay attention to to make sure our subjects were very safe. Over the years, I transitioned to a broader role where um, I was responsible for the overall safe non-clinical safety package, uh, not just the first in human enabling mm -hmm. package. Okay. You know, I would follow a, a compound through from early discovery all the way through to post-marketing monitoring in terms of uh, the safety profile. So I did that for uh, about 17 years. Yeah, and so in the in the CNS space, I guess as you mentioned, a lot of that is looking at the off-target effects and the side effects. Uh, are the CNS drugs generally safe, but they have too many side effects? That that almost seems like a contradiction to say it, but I, I maybe yeah, you get I think what one I'm, of the yeah, I know what you mean one of the biggest challenges are that. Um, you're modulating receptor systems that are ubiquitous throughout the body. So mm -hmm. you may have, uh, you know, you're trying to modulate dopamine in the brain, for right. example, in uh, the striatum for Parkinson's disease. Right. You know, there's also dopamine receptors throughout the body outside the brain. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you're modulating a receptor system and not being real specific, you can cause actually on-target undesired pharmacology. Uh, okay. And so by, by learning more about the brain and targeting receptors that are, are more localized in the brain only, you can reduce those broader adverse effects or uh, even on target undesired effects. Mm -hmm. um, the other problem is you're modulating, you know, to basically what you're doing with neuroscience is you're taking basically normal brain physiology in some cases and um, you're trying to modulate only very specific things. You're trying to block hallucinations or you're trying to change motor problems. Mm -hmm. And um, you're hitting the whole brain, not just those very specific regions right. of the brain. And so you get a lot of uh, undesired effects that way. 
Yeah, so I, I recall um, a drug that I worked on, and, and as you know, I'm a mass spectrometrist, bioanalytical scientist by training, and I don't recall if it was a originally a CNS drug, and then it uh, it they found that there were um, more positive indications in a in a IBS, or if it went the other way, if it was IBS and wasn't working, mm-hmm. and they found some uh, some indications in the brain, and and uh, that was the first time again going back probably 20 years of my career that I went, Oh, I didn't, I didn't realize there were similar receptors in your brain and your gut, right? That could, exactly. Could both be hit. Yeah, yeah. That's actually, that highlights one of the big problems is the blood brain barrier. So to get a good penetration into the brain, you know, a lot of times you have to load up the periphery uh, with a drug. And mm-hmm. so you have a higher exposure in the periphery, which potentially enables uh, adverse effects that are less desired in the periphery. Uh, relative to the uh, amount that gets in the brain. So you have to have a really good uh, penetration through the blood-brain barrier. Ideally, you have basically a one-to-one ratio, but that's that's a very challenging uh, proposition to do. Yeah, so speaking of crossing the blood-brain barrier, um, when, when I think of state-of-the-art in drug development, I, I think of biologics and, and more recently uh, gene therapy, and, and that's been... Uh, CNS has been a tough spot to um, utilize biologics and, and gene therapy. Is that an area where uh, Cerevel is looking to uh, to explore that space? Well, right now, all of our clinical assets are small molecules that mm-hmm. are uh, have great, uh, really good brain penetration, and so. Um, what we would be interested in is, you know, we identify a, a, a disease that we're interested in, and we would figure out what modality would be appropriate to target that disease. Okay. If it was a monoclonal, we would be, you know, interested in exploring that potentially or small molecule. So, um, although our, our clinical portfolio is small molecule at the time, at, at this time, you know, we would be sort of modality agnostic if there was an opportunity that arose in our discovery portfolio to look at, um, you know, an alternative uh, modality. Mm -hmm. Uh, But one of the big challenges, as I'm sure you're aware, is monoclonals only get in about 0.1% exposure into the brain. Mm -hmm. And so you have to really load up a dose uh, with milligram quantities, which is very expensive for cost of goods, as well as loading up uh, just a lot of extra antibody to modulate uh, Mm -hmm. uh, an intra-brain target in that way. It's certainly possible, uh, but it's very challenging. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So, so I, I wanted to ask you then about Cerevel. So, I mean, we've talked a lot about Cerevel, but your your transition to Cerevel, I guess they lured you up there from Philadelphia up to the up to Massachusetts to the Cambridge area. You know, what for you made it exciting to join Cerevel specifically, and what's your role there now as a as a senior yeah. VP uh, at Cerevel? Yeah, so, um, you know, what I really learned from big pharma, and it's not just Merck, but I think it's all all the big pharmaceutical companies, uh, they have a lot of overhead and um, a lot of inefficiencies that I really wanted to try and um, try and figure out a better way. So uh, the thing that really intrigued me with Cerevel was the assets that it was formed with were um, very well evaluated, very intentionally designed, very carefully designed by Pfizer scientists. But I wanted to come and... and explore a way to develop drugs um, that's capital efficient. And what I mean by that is the cost of pharmaceuticals, as we know, are very, very high, and it's a big burden to patients. And it might, you know, what I want to do is I want to provide new medicines to patients. Uh, We want to make them affordable. Drug development is super expensive. And so there's got to be a way to do that that's more capital efficient. And so Cerevel offered an opportunity in my mind to potentially develop drugs, bring them to market in a way that is more cost efficient than um, you know a large company could do, uh, a little bit more nimbly than a large company could do. And so that was one of the big reasons I came to Cerevel. My whole career has been on neuroscience, and um, the portfolio of assets we had, the opportunity was just really, really exciting. And so uh, that's that's how I ended up coming up uh, to Cerevel from Merck. And so, uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, about your role there? And I and I know it's expanded in the last couple of years, and you're you're growing your group. And then, what what do you tell people about Cerevel when they're probably some of the same things that excited you? But what do you tell people that uh, that you want to join uh, join Cerevel and, and become a part of your team or the sure. or the Cerevel team? Yeah. So my my role right now is uh, I'm responsible for the non clinical safety evaluation of all of our uh, molecules uh, mm-hmm. before they go into humans, but also 
we do work uh, all throughout the development process to ensure the safety of the molecules. So I have a team that that works on that. And then I also have a research operations group that uh, supports uh, with project management activities for the non-clinical scientists to keep things organized, you know, people that um, keep all of our CRO relationships organized as, as, uh, you know, that can be very complicated to keep all that business side of things going for scientists. I also have... um, the laboratory facilities folks reported to me in EHS, so environmental health and safety. So I'm the site head for the the laboratory, and so I'm responsible for all of the infrastructure related to uh, keeping the the labs going. Uh, we've got a, a very busy uh, in vitro biology and chemistry in uh, uh, laboratories in our, in Cambridge. Very cool. What what therapeutic areas? Uh, you know, we just talked broadly about CNS, but what therapeutic areas specifically is uh, is Cerevel working in? Yeah, so we've got a number of areas of interest. So one of our late stage uh, phase three molecules, tavapidon, is um, being studied for uh, Parkinson's disease, so um, symptomatic relief of Parkinson's disease. We have uh, a couple other assets, uh, one one called emraclidine that is for, uh, we're hoping for schizophrenia. So that's in uh, phase two trials right now for schizophrenia. Uh, And then we've got another asset, named Derigabat, and that is uh, being studied for uh, epilepsy currently. Okay. This is a, kind of a random question, but I could imagine we have listeners that um, that don't really know how this works. So drugs get these crazy names, right? Uh, Tavapidon, Imraclidine. Uh, I, I, can't, I didn't write down the third one. I can't remember it. But uh, can you talk a little bit about how those names happen? Yeah, so those are all what would be considered sort of the chemical names, the generic names, so to speak. And I'm a so chemist, so those wouldn't be the chemical names. No, those no, no, be, no, yeah, no, the no, 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 no. They're not the IUPAC names. No, 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 that's, that's true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but there's a there's an international uh, body that helps name uh, new molecules. And so at, at a point, usually, you know, around phase two clinical development time frame, a company will submit a, uh, a request for a generic name. And that package of information goes into this uh, this body, and they um, assign the name based on the target. Um, so if there are similar molecules in the class, they'll have kind of similar naming conventions. So Tavapidon would have a name similar to another dopamine uh, one partial agonist, for example, if others mm-hmm. existed. So that's how the generic name is established. So it's a sort of a regulatory process. And then when you submit for marketing approval, you have to put a package together for what your branded name would be. Mm -hmm. And that's more of a marketing type process. Mm-hmm. And so there are uh, firms that specialize in naming pharmaceuticals. And so even big pharmas engage these specialty um, companies for uh, naming drugs. And it's a pretty long process. You have to come up with four or five options that you think are mm-hmm. appropriate. And it's got to meet all kinds of restrictions. It can't be you know, offensive in various languages. It can't uh, sound too commercial. Uh, it's got to be a unique name in the in that class of drugs, so it doesn't get confused with other drugs. It's a pretty big process, but uh, it's rather interesting uh, how it happens. Then you get these sometimes very unusual names. Yeah, I suppose. Well, you saw a couple of drugs, I think, when you, in your Merck time, go from uh, really early on to uh, to actual uh, marketing and, and yeah. post marketing and things like that. So you, you've seen that whole process, which is certainly a I would say it's one of the coolest things about working in the pharma side of the industry versus the CRO side of the industry, where, whereas, you know, on the CRO side, one of the, one of the things that's exciting is you see so many different molecules from so many different therapeutic areas and, and CROs love to, uh, well, it's our whole business is supporting uh, pharma generally. Can you talk about, for me, you said you, you manage some of the CRO relationships. What, what that role is in in uh, for CROs supporting a, mm-hmm. a company like uh, like Cerevel? Yeah, so um, one of my most fundamental important uh, aspects of working with CROs is I try and incorporate the CRO partners into my team. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, some sponsors uh, have a real like standoff. They don't tell you anything about the drug. They, they don't want you to know any information or background, and they treat you more like a service provider. 
I really prefer to really integrate the CRO partner into our team in a, in a really strong mm-hmm. way. Uh, we identify favorite scientists we work with and request them uh, over and over because uh, that relationship is really, really important. Mm-hmm. And so I would say the, the number one thing that I do and I believe is uh, – I think is best practice is to treat the CRO just like an extension of your own company. Mm-hmm. Because uh, there are extremely capable scientists and in, in mm-hmm. CROs, and right. not taking advantage of that expertise is a huge mistake. Yeah, one of one of the things that I learned as a you know in the in the CRO industry is when you get those deeper relationships. Um, I completely agree; it, it's the way it should be. But I also learned that seeing deeper inside of what goes on in the in the pharma company or the, or the biotech or whatever we want to classify it as, you also see more of the noise. And, and it was interesting um, with a big relationship I had a few years ago with a company because we saw more of that noise. So we wanted to see deeper into the pipeline, but then you see more of the noise. And, and I didn't, I, I don't think I had fully realized how much um, noise in terms of start dates for trials, different mm-hmm. drugs, and all these different pieces that my uh, pharma contacts, if you will, my pharma project managers or, or bioanalytical lab directors or whatever the role was, they were filtering out so much of that. Uh, oh, yeah. For us, so yeah, yeah, yeah it's a uh, you know on the because I worked in a CRO on the CRO side on the pro, on mm-hmm. the service provider side, you only see the frustration of study start dates changing constantly and drug delivery dates changing constantly, and mm-hmm. um, you don't really understand or know why. You just think the partner is being um, irritating. <laughs> yeah, and then yeah. when you start to see it on the uh, the sponsor side of the business, and you see it's all about the complexity of that noise, as you call it, in yeah. terms of you know, production didn't go well for uh, material that you need for the study or priorities are shifting at the company. You know, they can't find clinical sites mm-hmm. to enable a study. So all of that complexity in that drug development process does get filtered out for the CRO a lot of times. Uh, so it's good when you see that chaos. Yeah, sometimes I go overly nerdy with the way I think of things, as you know. Uh, and uh, I think of these like a like a Fourier transform. A Fourier transform goes from the time domain to the frequency domain, and you and you apply a Fourier transform. And I've always thought of, you see this decay of of noise down uh, as time goes on. You see this you know reduction in noise. And I for some reason when I when I see that I always think of you know, how that works. So anyways, probably over the top, nerdy well, on nice the math It's nice to know that there, you're but... still a math nerd. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So Rick, if you, um, if you were to not be in the CNS development space for pharmaceutical industry, like if somebody said, or, or maybe even said, Hey, maybe you, maybe you nail it at Cerevel with a couple of big drugs and then some years down the road, you want to move into a different uh, development space. What what area of drug development would you want to work in? I have worked in cardiovascular metabolic diseases in the past, mm-hmm. and uh, I, I think those uh, that area actually has a lot of uh, opportunity still. Mm-hmm. Um, it's pretty well taken care of, but if you look at the number one cause for mortality in, in the United States, it's still cardiovascular disease for the most yeah. part. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so although there's a lot of medication for various conditions, there, there's still a lot of space, I think, for doing better and understanding those uh, areas better. And, you know, diabetes is a huge growing problem in our country as well. And so I think the diabetes, uh, metabolic, cardiovascular space would be very interesting. Yeah, cool. So one of the areas that I like to talk to folks about is uh, also mentoring. And uh, it's a little bit, again, it's outside of our, our regular drug development talk, but I'm curious how you've taken that role on or any, any great mentors that you've had in the industry along the way that have influenced you that you might tell us about lessons you've learned or, or lessons you might share for, uh, for others in that, uh, in that space. Yeah, so, uh, so I think that's super important. So that's a great, uh, great topic. So I would say um, I, I try very hard to mentor people that have a lot of potential. Um, mm-hmm. And those that don't really see their own potential, um, those are the people I really, uh, really enjoy mentoring to try and get them outside of their comfort zone uh, is, is what I always tell them. And it's not even the people that I'm a direct line manager for. At Merck, for a number of years, I participated in a, in a formalized mentoring program at, at Merck where we would mm-hmm. get paired up with uh, a, a more junior scientist. 
uh, working with those uh, through that program, but also just informally. You know, we have uh, college interns at our company, so mentoring the college intern, I stay in contact with some of them over the years, and um, I just think it's super important to help give them that perspective, uh, how to make decisions for their career along the way. I have benefited from, um, you know, a lot of really important people in my career, um, you know, from my PhD advisor at the University of Oklahoma, Dave Govan. Gary Dunbar at Central Michigan University, who I mentioned, um, my postdoc advisor, Gail Winger at the University of Michigan. Uh, you know, those early, those early years were super important to helping me get established. And then through my career in the industry, um, you know, I haven't really had what I would consider a, a real um, long-term mentor, but it's always been uh, people that have kind of taken me under their wing to help me really advance in different ways that I never expected. Yeah. And I think, uh, well, we're both north of 50 now and I, I don't know about you, but I, but I've started to feel like, all right, uh, w- while I've mentored and, and, and trained and supported people, I've started feeling like, okay, now I'm really getting to that give back mode of my career. And, and, uh, in fact, I was at, uh, I was at a conference, uh, last week and, I'll admit, I started feeling like the old guy because I started telling all these stories and I started realizing they were, uh, you know, the, the, the folks I was, uh, t- you know, giving advice and talking about how to navigate the meeting and see this person's talk because they're, you know, they'll give a fantastic talk. I started realizing, uh, you know, they, they maybe were, you know, in kindergarten when, you know, when I, when I first started building <laughs> some of these relationships or, or younger <laughs> or younger in some cases. Yeah. So. I'm sure I'm sure you've experienced that as well. And you've been involved in a number of uh, societies over the years as well. I know you were in the Safety Pharmacology Society and what else? Tell me about your experience uh, being involved in, in different organizations like that and how that's impacted. Yeah, so I've been uh, I think scientific society involvement is super important for scientists on a number of levels. It helps advance the field. It gives visibility to the field. It helps advance you professionally as an individual, but also helps uh, mentor junior scientists. Uh, The Safety Pharmacology Society uh, is sort of my favorite society, so to speak, uh, mainly because um, I got involved very early in my career while that society was just forming. Uh, It's Mm -hmm. only been around for a little over 20 years now. Uh, I served on the board of directors for that society for several years, and I was also president of the society uh, back in 2009. Mm -hmm. And so um, that really helped me, uh, you know, network in a global way. It's an international society. I met lots of people. It really helped uh, give me a perspective of how others are doing things. Mm -hmm. Um, Drug development's a super complex business. And, uh, you know, there's a hundred ways you can accomplish the same task. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's important to broaden your understanding of other people's uh, methodologies. And societies really help foster that. So as a younger brother, I've always been pretty good at at trying to get you in trouble. So I stayed out of trouble. So I'm going to ask you a question (laughs) uh, for for mom and dad. What's What's the number one lesson you learned from mom? And what's the number one lesson you learned from dad? Oh boy, that's a really good one. <laughs> so, um, you know, I think from from mom, I learned to be a tenacious, never give up fighter when it comes to accomplishing a, a project. And um, you know, w- one of the things I really learned from her was um, when you say you're going to do something, failure is not an option. And so, <laughs> I really learned that, and uh, that served me well over the years. It does cause some stress, but, uh, you know, it's helped me fight through a lot of really challenging uh, drug development problems over the years. So I would say that that's definitely something I, I got from mom. From dad, I really got, a, a, I think, a different perspective on, um, you know, how to deal with people. He's a real people person. And one mm-hmm. of the things that scientists really lack a lot of times is the ability to really interact with people in a um, sort of a way that's more social. Um, mm-hmm. And um, I, I think I really, uh, I really got a lot of that from him. So I, I had mentioned to you that I was going to ask you a couple you know, surprise questions, if you will. But you said, hey, you should ask me what uh, what's my dirtiest job ever. And so I, I have to ask because now I'm really curious. So, uh, yeah. so what was your dirtiest job you ever did? 
Yeah, so I, I have two particularly dirty jobs. So one dirty job was one that you also did was detasseling corn. Mm-hmm. And so if you're from seed corn territory in the Midwest and you're uh, a 15-year-old kid and you need a job in the summer, you detassel corn. At least that's what we used to do. Um, mm-hmm. That was a pretty dirty job spending um, you know, long days in a cornfield full of mud and dirt and wet and everything that goes with that. Wet in the morning and dry in the afternoon. Yeah, absolutely. And, and absolutely. when we were doing it, no bathrooms in the field. No, no. Why would you have <laughs> bathrooms for, uh, for child labor? <laughs> um, so that that was one that was one dirty job, and um, if no, none of the uh, listeners know what corn detasseling is, they should just Google it, and then they'll see and they'll think we're crazy for having done it. Yep. Uh, the other dirty job I had was in college. I did uh, commercial construction as a laborer for a while, and um, I spent basically the whole summer cutting concrete with a big concrete saw and getting myself covered in concrete dust, jackhammering. And uh, literally digging ditches all summer long. That was pretty dirty. I would come home every day completely covered in concrete dust and dirt and mud and uh, really learned uh, (laughs) how to work physically very hard. Uh, Also was a really good encouragement to stay in college. Yeah, well, without a doubt, without a doubt. Rick is... I've really enjoyed chatting with you, uh, you know, and I find it interesting when I do these discussions because... I've certainly recruited a lot of guests. There were people I thought I knew well, and I always learn new things about them and new insights. And yeah, that, that goes for, uh, for me today, talking with you. Um, certainly, you've been a fantastic big brother, mentor to me over the years. Thank you for that. Thank you for joining the podcast today. Is there anything else that you want to add or any, any closing comments that you might have before, uh, before we uh, head off? No, I would just say that I, I think probably most of the people that you interview uh, are in the pharmaceutical business of some sort, and uh, most of the listeners are probably also similar in the pharmaceutical industry. And I just want to thank everybody for working to bring medicines to patients that need them. Patients are waiting for new therapies, and our job is to get that done. And so I would just hope that everybody works with a sense of urgency and thoughtfulness and that's what we can all do as a an industry together without a doubt well thanks so much rick and that's all for this episode of molecular moments if you enjoyed today's episode be sure to subscribe on apple podcasts spotify or your favorite podcast app so you never miss a conversation if you'd like to hang out with us outside of the podcast, we have many webinars and other presentations available for your enjoyment and education. Visit bioagilitics.com to see what's coming up and how you can stay in touch. And don't forget to keep an eye out for more episodes coming soon. We're looking forward to some great guests from across the bioanalytical field and the pharmaceutical development. Thanks for listening to the Molecular Moments podcast. 